welcome. Uh, thanks, Dean, for that introduction, and welcome uh, to all of you uh, from all around the world. Uh, some of you will know that I've been uh, very excited with the prospect of chairing this session, and my excitement has been mounting daily. Um, you all know me, perhaps, if you know me at all, as uh, the lead for tobacco control at Public Health England, but I first got involved in public health over 30 years ago during the AIDS pandemic. And um, the big difference between the AIDS pandemic and the smoking pandemic is that uh, AIDS knew right from the start how to target the most vulnerable and single them out. And so a lot of my work in HIV was uh, with other gay men, with drug users, with uh, street prostitutes, um, with uh, some of the most uh, marginalized uh, members of the, uh, of the community. Um, smoking has learned that trick only gradually. It started off uh, as a, a very widespread scourge, uh, but increasingly has been focused more and more as kind of wealthy, more educated smokers have been quick quitting. Uh, it's a, a, a burden that falls most heavily uh, on the most disadvantaged and the most excluded. Now, I was uh, committed to harm reduction back then, and I'm committed to harm reduction now. And uh, harm reduction isn't just about reducing harm. There's some kind of ethical underpinnings. And one of them is um, bringing the most excluded people right into the process and uh, with a, a respect and a sense of uh, parity of uh, no more top-down paternalistic health promotion, uh, but very much a kind of shoulder-to-shoulder um, uh, -shoulder approach. Um, that's one of the things that I really, really like about this, uh, this project right from the start. Um, I think there's uh, been a, uh, a commitment to uh, respect and inclusion and, um, uh, I don't know, like a kind of honoring of uh, the people that we uh, work with rather than a pathologizing of them. And uh, well, you'll see more about that as the, the speakers uh, present. We have um, a, a great bunch of speakers, and it was only just as I was preparing uh, to this little introduction that I realized that each of the uh, main presenters, uh, it, it, all, all the main presenters are women. Um, and uh, I've been thinking over the last couple of weeks how uh, actually tobacco control in the UK uh, is blessed by these really... Uh, not just these, but many really insightful uh, women who kind of shape the thinking, uh, shape the culture of UK tobacco control. And I think we have a, um, a lot to thank them for, for in a sense, like feminizing what maybe previously had been a fairly male dominated um, kind of thought culture. So leave you with that. Maybe we want to uh, pick some of that up again in the future, uh, the, the role of, um, of, of, of gender in uh, developing public health cultures. Uh, but I'm not going to delay any further. I'm sure that you'd much rather hear from uh, the presenters than hear from me. Um, it's a, a really interesting um, set of projects that we're going to hear from. We're going to, uh, initially, we're going to hear about uh, a project working with homeless smokers, a feasibility randomized control trial. Uh, Professor Lynn Dawkins is going to speak first. I remember Lynn from when she was first, uh, when she was at uh, the University of, East of uh, London, University of East London, and uh, now, of course, is, uh, for some years has been professor at London South Bank University and doing right from the start some really, really interesting work on um, on e-cigarettes and something of an outsider in the in the uh, tobacco control research community initially, uh, but now right at the heart, uh, she's going to present, be presenting the quantitative, the numbers. Um, she's going to hand over to Alison Ford, Dr. Ford from uh, Sterling, uh, whose quality, Alison knows, I've been in awe of the beautiful nuance of her qualitative research uh, right from the start. Um, a qualitative research, if for any of you don't know, it's it's not so much about the numbers, but it's about the more about the, the feel, about the, the context. And then we're going to switch projects entirely. We'll have a little comfort break. Uh, Dr. Debbie Robson uh, is going to be speaking about 
uh, a, a project uh, funded by CRUK, integrating tobacco dependent support within substance use. And then we're going to uh, go into a, a panel discussion and we're looking forward to you having your questions uh, for us. So you can uh, start adding questions now. Um, and Dean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we want people to do that in the Q&A box. Uh, keep your eye on the chat box for other messages, which I'm not doing. I've got to say perhaps I should have done. Anyway, um, let's kick off with uh, Professor Dawkins. Uh, Lynn, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. Just coming. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I'm just going to share my screen and thank you for your introduction, Martin. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my slides now. And um, as Martin said, I'm going to talk alongside Alison Ford. Um, I'm going to talk for about the first 20, 25 minutes and then pass you over to Alison to tell you a little bit more about this project. Um, this was a feasibility study which we designed to explore the uptake and use of electronic cigarettes that were provided to smokers who were accessing homeless centre services. So I want to start by just talking about smoking prevalence amongst this group. So this was a systematic review that myself and my colleagues conducted and um, published last year. And we looked at all the studies that had been published in the field of smoking cessation in a homeless population. And we found across these 52 studies that we identified that smoking prevalence rates were really exceptionally high. Um, and range between 57 to 82% across these, these 52 studies. And these are research studies. And actually, if you look at the figures from the homeless charities, the prevalence rate amongst people accessing those services is estimated to be even higher, somewhere between 70 to 90%. So given that the current smoking prevalence in the UK is around 15%, we really are seeing exceptionally high levels of smoking amongst individuals accessing homeless services. The other thing that became quite apparent from this review of studies in this area is that most of the publications derived from the US, so 46 from the US, and really very few from other parts of the world. And in Europe in, particularly, in particular, there was only one study published in relation to smoking cessation and the homeless, and this was in the UK. So we really have overlooked this group in relation to smoking. And given that smoking prevalence rates are so high, clearly more needs to be done on this um, subject. We interviewed um, 286 adult smokers who were accessing homeless centre services a couple of years ago. And what was quite apparent from the results of that fairly small survey um, was that the interest in quitting smoking was really still quite high and comparable to um, desire to quit amongst the, the general population. So 85% of smokers that were that completed this survey reported some history of attempting to quit and two thirds were keen on trying to quit and many had tried to quit in the past. So why an e-cigarette then? Well, we know that e-cigarettes are the most popular form of attempting to quit amongst smokers in the general population and people experiencing homelessness are no different. This was also the pre preferred method to try and quit amongst smokers experiencing homelessness. And um, in fact, 82 had even tried an e-cigarette in the past, um, but many couldn't afford the cost of a starter pack, a starter kit. A starter kit, you know, a reasonable starter kit is around 25 pounds. And most smokers in this survey reported that they were only able or willing to pay about five to 10 pounds for an e-cigarette. So that's a real barrier to getting started with the device that has been shown in the general population to be really quite effective at helping people 
to quit smoking. Another barrier that we identified from this survey in, in this population was that most smokers just hung out with other people who also smoked. So that makes it really quite difficult. If everybody around you is also smoking, that can be a real barrier to, to trying to quit. So the overall aim of our study was to explore the feasibility of providing a free e-cigarette starter kit to smokers accessing homeless centres. And what we mean by exploring the feasibility is before we go on and we do a really big randomised controlled trial to look at whether giving e-cigarettes can help people to quit compared to what they usually do in these centres, we wanted to know whether the study kind of would work. So would people even be willing to take part? Would they be willing and accepting of an offer of an e-cigarette? And if we gave people an e-cigarette, would they manage to keep hold of it or would they lose it or break it or have it stolen, for example? Whoops, I just want to go back because I'm not ready for that slide yet. And um, would people come back for follow-up appointments to tell us about their experiences and their smoking behaviour after 4, 12 and 24 weeks? And finally, we also wanted to look at whether there was any preliminary evidence that e-cigarettes can help people to reduce their smoking or even quit. And if we can get that information, we'll have a really good idea of whether it would be possible to run a really big trial across, the, across Great Britain and how many people and how many centres we would need to do that. So um, this is um, quite a detailed slide, but it's just a basic study overview of how we designed the trial. So we started by allocating whole centres to either an e-cigarette arm or an e-cigarette group or a usual care group. And we did this, we, we originally thought that we would randomly allocate individuals attending the centre to either receive an e-cigarette or to receive usual care. But staff at centres and service users strongly recommended against this approach because there may be disharmony amongst clients where some are perceived to be getting um, an e-cigarette of value and others uh, are not getting anything. So we allocated by centre. Our centre staff then screened our participants to check for eligibility and invited those who were eligible to make an appointment with our researcher. So eligible participants were obviously those who smoked, who were over 18, who were known to the centre and regularly accessing the, the um, services and who were able to provide consent. We, those participants who were interested in taking part then made an appointment with our researcher for a baseline assessment and we took information about housing status, demographics, history around smoking and vaping, um, other things like mental health and drug and alcohol use. After that assessment, our participants then went to see a member of staff at the centre and were given information about their condition, whether it was e-cigarette or usual care, depending on the centre they were accessing. And we then attempted to follow up everyone four weeks later, 12 weeks later and 24 weeks later. And between the four and the eight week time point, we also attempted to interview 24 members of staff and 12, sorry, 24 participants and 12 members of staff to get a bit more um, detailed insights into perceived barriers and facilitators around the, the intervention. And that's something that Alison will talk about in a lot more detail. One point to mention here, actually I, I should have mentioned earlier, is we, estimated that we'd be able to see about 120 in total and we would allocate um, well that would be 60 people in each group in the e-cigarette group and, and the usual care group we didn't quite achieve this um, target but I'll come to talk about um, recruitment in a minute so this just gives a bit more information about the centres that took part. We had four centres, one in Edinburgh, one in Northampton and two in London. And the centres really differed quite a lot from each other. So we had two centres that were daycare centres, very busy centres that see between 20 and 100 people a day. 
And then we had two centres in London that were both residential centres, which were smaller, around kind of 20 to 35 beds and often split site. So we kind of paired one day centre with one residential centre to make sure that we had kind of representation across the day centres and the residential centres for both conditions. So we ended up with one daycare centre in the e-cigarette condition and one daycare centre in the usual care condition and the same for the residential centres. A little bit more about what we did in each condition then. So I've mentioned usual care and haven't really said very much about what usual care is at the moment. Well, in fact, this it, usual care differs a lot from centre to centre and is usually, although not always, simply referral to the local stop smoking service. So we went slightly beyond that and we developed a um, 10 tips to help you stop smoking fact sheet, which was actually adapted from the NHS Choices website. Um, some of the language was changed and some slight adaptions to make it applicable to this population. And we also included information on that fact sheet about the services of the local stop smoking service, the address, the opening hours and um, where to go. And we advised people in that usual care condition to make contact and set an appointment with the local stop smoking service. Then in the e-cigarette condition, we offered people a free e-cigarette starter kit. And that included the Pockex e-cigarette, which looks a bit like this. And it came with a, a charger and an atomizer. And we also provided one week's worth of e-liquid at the baseline appointment. And we developed a tips and tricks leaflet to help people get started with it. And this was developed um, alongside experienced vapors. The people in the e-cigarette arm then came back every week for, for the next three weeks, so four weeks in total, to get extra supplies of e-liquid at one weekly intervals for four weeks. At the baseline appointment, we also gave people a bit of choice because that reflects what people do in the real world when they're using e-cigarettes. We gave them a choice of different flavors from menthol, fruit, and tobacco, and two different choices of um, nicotine e-liquid strength. So 18 milligram per milliliter or 12 milligram per milliliter. And people were um, allowed to kind of experiment to try those different flavors and strengths at the baseline appointment with a member of center staff who had previously been trained from the research team and they could decide um, which flavor and which strengths they wanted. So in terms of our um, participants, we had 65% male, which I think is representative of the homeless population. Although there is an argument that there's more hidden homelessness um, amongst women. The average age was 43 years. 60% were either in hostels or supported accommodation. Quite a low number were um, rough sleepers. Only 7% had reported that they had been rough sleeping in the previous few days. And um, typical of this population, we see very high reporting of long-standing illness or disability high reports of um, people being admitted to hospital for mental illness, and over half of our sample reported they'd previously spent time in prison. The average number of cigarettes they smoked per day was 20, and their average score on the Fagerstrom test of cigarette dependence was 5.5. And for those of you that are not familiar with this questionnaire, it, the dependent score can range from zero, not at all dependent, to 10, which is extremely high dependence. And actually a score of 5.5 is indicative of fairly heavy dependence and is a little bit higher than we usually see in studies in the general population. So First of all, I want to report about recruitment. So how willing were people to take part? So the staff at the center asked every participant, or every smoker accessing their service who was eligible. And you can see that in the e-cigarette arm, 106 people were asked overall 
and 48 people agreed and actually went on to consent to take part. So that's just under half of all people who were asked. And you can see that um, numbers varied depending on the centre. So most of the people um, who consented were from the Hope Centre, the, the busy day centre in, North, in Northampton, and fewer people were recruited from the smaller residential centre in, in London, St Mungo Centre. In the usual care arm, we are 72 people and 32 consented. So the conversion rate from being asked to consenting to take part was the same, um, although fewer people were, were asked and eligible. And again, we saw a, um, we were better at recruiting from the day centre, this time the centre in Edinburgh compared to the residential centre in London. So fairly good um, recruitment rates there. In terms of retention, so did people actually come back? So these, this table shows the number of people who came back in each condition at four weeks, 12 weeks and 24 weeks. And actually our retention was pretty good up until 12 weeks. And then we saw a bit of a drop off, especially in the usual care arm between that 12 and 24 week period. And this was mostly due to difficulties following people up at the day centre in Edinburgh. Actually, we were a bit more successful at um, following people up at the residential centre there. So the difference between retention in the e-cigarette versus the usual care arm, we don't think is due to the intervention per se, but rather just due to individual differences across the different centres, the day centre versus the residential. And most of the, the reasons why we couldn't follow people up was just due to unavoidable loss to follow up. People were simply not attending the service anymore. They'd moved out of the area. Some had been taken into hospital or taken into prison, for example. But overall, these retention rates are pretty good for this population and are certainly comparable or even better than many of the published studies on smoking cessation in the homeless in the, US, in the US. So next we were interested in whether people in the e-cigarette group actually were able to keep hold of their e-cigarette over the study period. So we asked people whether they still had the e-cigarette that we provided and whether they were still using it. And you can see that up to, up to 24 weeks, the, ma the majority of people did still actually have the e-cigarette we, we provided, 63% still had it. Um, now these, just to note, these percentages are of the people who actually attended follow-up, not the percentage of all people who were enrolled in the study at baseline, which would obviously be a little bit lower than this. You can also see that the number of people who yeah. reported that they were still using an e-cigarette is a little bit higher than the number of people who reported that they still had it. And there's two reasons for this. Firstly, it was the way we asked the question. And secondly, it was because some people were still using an e-cigarette, but it wasn't necessarily the one that we'd provided. They'd maybe got one from a friend because they didn't like theirs or they'd exchanged it or some had actually gone and, and purchased their own. So we were pretty encouraged by these findings. And for those people who didn't still have their e-cigarette, we asked why, what had happened. And the main reason was that it, it, it had been broken. Often people had dropped it and that had cracked or smashed the tank. And instances of things like it was lost or stolen or exchanged were actually fairly low. So breakages were the main reason why people didn't still have it. In the usual care group, we also asked whether participants had followed our recommendation to make contact with and attend the local stop smoking service. Now, not many people did actually do this, but if they did make contact, they did actually follow up and then make an appointment and attend. But we're seeing very low rates here, only kind of two to four people um, actually followed that recommendation. And, and this, this is not unexpected. 
Finally, then, what about quit rates? So our measure of quit rates is quite a robust measure. So this is sustained abstinence, which means it's continuous no smoking from uh, baseline through to 24 weeks um, or 12 weeks or four weeks, as shown in, in the table. And um, sustained abstinence actually allows up to five slips um, and this is the gold standard that is used in, in smoking cessation research. We also allowed a two week grace period from the time of being given the e-cigarette at baseline, because we know that there's a, it takes a couple of weeks to familiarize yourself with using the e-cigarette and um, to actually kind of make that full switch. So here are our findings and you can see at 24 weeks, three out of the 35 people who attended the follow-up point appointment in the e-cigarette arm were still reporting complete abstinence at that time point. And this compares to nobody, unfortunately, in the usual care arm. And for those of you that um, are wondering how this equates to an intention to treat analysis, whereby everyone who is lost to follow-up is treated as still smoking, the corresponding percentages there are 6.3% for the e-cigarette arm and of course 0% for the usual care arm. So we, this is a small sample size it, and it's a feasibility study, so we can't make any kind of grand, grand conclusions from this, but this does give us some confidence that we can proceed to a full trial and it helps us to develop the num to, to develop our um, sample size that would be required for that full trial to really explore with adequate power to detect an effect where the e-cigarettes are more effective than usual care for smoking cessation. Just a few obs other observations that I want to mention. We also measured risky smoking practices. So these are things like um, sharing cigarettes, um, picking up discarded um, cigarette ends and smoking them or re-rolling them or asking strangers for cigarettes. And actually, we saw that reports of these type of risky smoking practices declined over the course of the study in both groups, actually, not just in the e-cigarette arm. We also looked at depression, anxiety and alcohol use and report self-reported measures here also all showed that these declined over the 24 week period, again in both groups, and there was no change in drug use, which is a positive thing because there were some concerns that from our funders and our reviewers that drug use might increase and people might even use the e-cigarette to vape other illicit substances. And we actually asked about that and we found no evidence at all. There were no reports of anyone using the e-cigarette that we'd provided to vape other illicit drugs. E-cigarettes were very well tolerated. So we asked about any adverse effects or negative effects associated with e-cigarette use. And we saw very, very low levels of, of these reports, you know, things like dizziness or headache or feeling sick. Um, that wasn't a problem at all. So. Um, they were well accepted, well tolerated. Um, although one barrier was a very high incidence of cannabis smoking, which um, some people were able to quit smoking, but not to quit cannabis use, which of course meant that they don't count as a quitter in our analysis. And Alison will talk a lot more about that. So these findings um, from the quantitative part of the study are now published in PLUS One that was accepted and published last year. And if you want to look at that article, the details are there at the bottom of the slide. So just to say thank you then to end with, thank you to all members of the team. Thank you to our trial steering committee led by Professor Anne McNeil. Thanks, of course, to all the staff at the Homeless Centre um, who were absolutely wonderful and without which we, we wouldn't have been able to do this study at all. And finally, thank you to the National Institute of Health Research for funding this study. And hopefully they'll also fund our application for a larger full randomised controlled trial. So I'll stop sharing now and thank you for your attention.
Back to Martin. Back, I think, to Alison. Are you ready, Alison, to, uh, to present? Yep, I can go next. Just bear with me. I should, of course, say thank you, Lynn, for such a great talk. Alison, better it. Okay, that should be my slides ready now. So thank you, Martin, for the very kind introduction at the start of the session. And also thank you to Lynn for a great overview of the feasibility study. Um, I've skipped a slide already, there we go. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Lynn says, I'm going to be presenting the qualitative results um, from the feasibility study. So that's interviews that we conducted with staff and participants at each of our four homeless centers. So the call study was nested within the main feasibility study, but it did have some further specific objectives. Um, it was designed to give insight into participant and staff perceptions of the study and ultimately to produce learning and recommendations for a future trial, um, which Lynn just said we have, we have applied for funding for. So within this presentation, I'm going to focus on the first two research objectives here. So the barriers and facilitators to engagement with the study and some participant experiences and their perceived value of the study. So we conducted face-to-face -face interviews with a subsample, so a smaller sample, which was 22 study participants and 12 centre staff members. We purposely sampled according to centre and study arm. So we ended up with around three or four participants in each centre that took part and around three staff members in each centre as well. Um, the interviews were conducted between weeks four and eight. The intent was to um, speak to even numbers of participants who completed their four week follow up and those who did not complete their four week follow up. But unfortunately, we were only able to um, achieve three non completers in the interview sample. And this is a limitation of the qualitative sample. So I need to flag that up. Um, unfortunately, it was just incredibly difficult to reach those non completers to take part in a qualitative interview. It's unfortunate, it's not particularly surprising that they were hard to reach, um, but it is something to, to consider. Um, as part of the interview, um, participants were also provided a 15 pound Love to Shop gift card as a thank you for their time. Um, and all interviews were recorded and transcribed. So if I move on to just the main barriers, and I have three main barriers here to discuss today. So first of all, participants' personal barriers. So they told us that generally, you know, engaging in treatment programs was challenging for them. Um, and there were various factors to this. So first of all, some participants said, you know, that they found, a, a, you know, just being attentive difficult. Um, many said that they had um, anxiety around social interactions um, and just difficulties in, in you know, keeping and, and making appointments. We also, this is quite interesting, we also found some participants had real mistrust in research, in the research process, and I'm just going to read out some of this quote here. So they said, you know, um, that there's an ulterior motive here, that um, they're going to run a test on the homeless, maybe they've got a dodgy, ba a dodgy batch of e-liquid, um, you know, I think there's got to be an angle here. Um, so these were kind of real concerns that, that our participants told us they had. Um, there were very many concerns about providing personal data to us, um, about whether we would share what they told us with others, and, and, and if we were going to share data, um, who would we be sharing it with? This was a very real concern as well. Um, and some participants told us that they actually struggled to complete some of our questions. So as part of their baseline meeting and follow-up meetings, we had um, questionnaires that we asked participants to complete. Um, and there are a couple of sides to this. So some participants said um, it was actually quite difficult for them to recall some of the information we were asking them to provide, for example, if they'd had a period of drug use. Um, and um, some questions that we asked about mental health, um, some participants found that particularly difficult um, to, to answer those. Now, Lynn mentioned um, that, you know, incidence um, of cannabis smoking was high among our sample, and this is problematic for 
cessation studies. Um, I mean, in our interviews, some of our participants told us that they wanted to stop or reduce their cannabis use, but this presented additional concerns. So in addition to stopping smoking, whether that was challenging for them, there were additional concerns related to stopping their, their cannabis use. Um, so for example, you know, relaxation after a difficult day. I remember one participant saying, I've been wound up all day. I have a really, really stressful day and this really helps me to cope, to cope with that day. A few participants who had um, previously been addicted to substances such as heroin said that actually their cannabis smoking, they viewed it as a protective factor in abstaining from other substances. Um, there was, again, I can recall another participant who said, you know, I've condensed all my substance use into what's remaining now is two joints in the evening. And I really look forward to that. And that's what I have left. And, you know, to the, the actual thought of stopping that, I'm terrified of that. Um, and then finally, um, some of our participants um, also said that they were really worried that if they stopped their cannabis use, um, it might heighten um, mental health symptoms that they experienced. And one participant said that he had experienced that in the, in the past. And then the third main barrier that we found were staff assumptions. So when we spoke with staff in the interviews, um, many said that, you know, before the study, they really believed that stopping smoking was just not a priority or concern for their clients. Um, and they would always prioritize other support needs. So, you know, supporting people with their um, lifestyles, chaotic lifestyles or mental health, substance use. And actually, you know, staff would say, you know, why, you, why would you ask me to take away the one thing that's a rare comfort and enjoyment for my clients? I just don't want to go there. And that's some of the, um, the feedback we were getting from staff. Um, and, and because of that, it's not surprising that many staff said, you know, they just didn't discuss smoking with their clients. It's just not something that um, really, you know, that, that, that really came up. Um, and, and staff also told us that they did make some judgments about what would happen as the study progressed, which clients would engage. And, you know, they were very skeptical about the study and thought, you know, none of their clients would be interested in taking part. And in this quote in the pale yellow, um, you know, I thought this was insane. I thought you're just going to take the device. And, and a few staff members said, you know, I expected them to sell their devices. So these were real staff, you know, these are real barriers that we had at the, at the beginning of the study. Um, I'll move on to some of the facilitators that we found. So firstly, just being presented with an opportunity. Um, so when we spoke to participants, you know, they told us that they did want to stop smoking or reduce their smoking. And, you know, just similar to other smokers, they, you know, had real concerns about the impact of smoking on their finances, on their health. Um, the problem was that traditional routes of support were they, they told us it was unappealing for them, whether, you know, if they had to make appointments through their GP or something like that. Um, and, and ultimately what the study did is that it, you know, it, it capitalized on existing client routines and regular attendance at the center, you know, they were already there. And there's some quotes here said, you know, well, I wouldn't have bothered to give up. I had no plans of giving up until that day, that day that they were approached at their center where they were anyway. Um, and the second facilitator was the incentives or, and free e -cig. So I think that I saw a question in the Q&A box earlier. Um, participants were offered a £15 Love to Shop gift card for each follow-up they, they attended. Um, and that was across both study arms. So, um, so these, the incentives and the free e -cig, you know, it was, it, it was a, people told us it was appealing, you know, when, when you have a lack of, lack of resources. The gift card was particularly important in usual care recruitment, particularly because usual care in itself wasn't necessarily that appealing, people told us. Um, and and when, we, when we asked people about those gift cards and, you know, and, and this was something the funder asked us to, um, to explore, you know, generally there were one or two instances where this wasn't the case, but generally people said that they were used for essential purchases for food or the intention to try save up those gift cards so they could treat themselves or, or a family member. So it was really used for kind of, you know, essential essential things and then with with you know obviously for those in the in the e-cigarette arm um, that the e-cigarette itself was a great motivator to take part and, and to try it and and this participant in the green quote here you know i wanted to do it before 
but thought it was going to be really costly to start up. I haven't got spare 30 pounds. I'm only living on 50 pounds a week. And this is a really interesting facilitator that we found. This is the social context. So in these environments, you can find some quite strong social dynamics. And in other cessation studies, you often find that this is a barrier um, to smoking cessation, these social dynamics, the smoking together. Um, but in, in, in our study, this actually became a facilitator in the, in the vaping arm of the study. So what we found was that some study participants became really strong study and vaping advocates. Um, and actually, you know, particularly when participants became involved with, um, you know, social status among, among their peers, this made other people stand up and take note and become interested in, in the study and also in vaping. We found that there was loads of peer support going on, peer-to-peer -peer support. So there was a lot of discussions between, between participants about devices, about, you know, how to vape and, and e-liquids to try and mix in different flavors. There was loads of that going on. Um, and social vaping, you know, we really observed people, people vaping together. And, and you can see here, you know, there was no stigma attached to it anymore. You could just vape happily, six or seven of us vaping together. Um, and what the study, what we found here was that the study really generated a vaping community and vaping norms, which was um, a real positive outcome when this had always been seen as a barrier in the past, these social dynamics. Okay, and then the final and one of the key facilitators as well was staff training. So this was led by Debbie Robson, who's presenting shortly after me. Um, and the training was tailored for usual care or e-cigarette centers. Um, and it covered, you know, smoking and issues around smoking for usual care. It covered um, what stop smoking services looked like and what support would be offered there. And it covered the research study. And in the e-cigarette arm, it was similar, except instead of focusing on stop smoking services, it's, it focused on e-cigarettes. And staff told us that, you know, this was a really key element for them for engagement with and belief in the study. And this was really important because staff helped, you know, we were in staff's environment. We were asking them to help with the study. They helped facilitate recruitment. They helped signpost people to in usual care. They helped um, set people up with the e-cigarette and offer ongoing support. So it was really crucial that, that we had this. And staff said, you know, after the training, and it really increased my knowledge and interest in smoking cessation. I view it, the importance around this, I view differently now. And, it, and obviously my increased knowledge now about e-cigarettes and harm reduction, they really valued, valued this from the training. And staff felt better equipped after the training, they said to have, you know, they felt more confident to have these smoking discussions, which they never really the ones that we spoke to never really um, had these had these discussions before and many reported attitude changes and that actually their practice they expected their practice around this to change um, in the longer term as well like once the study had finished and I have a really lovely quote here from one of the managers at one of the usual care centers and, and you know she said you know smoking wasn't a priority at all the whole study has made me rethink it's the same discussion part of harm reduction as we have about safer injecting techniques and she really believed that their practice would change um, because of being involved involved in the study so just quickly i have just two slides on the participant experiences uh, i've just focused on the vaping arm here um, so initially Participants told us that they had really low expectations of vaping. Um, you know, some people said they just really didn't think it was going to be for them. Uh, some people said even described themselves as anti-vape almost. It didn't stop them trying it because um, they were presented with this opportunity, but their expectations were actually really quite low. And then what they told us was that over time, you know, as they became more used to vaping, more experienced, they just found that it did fit in with their routines. Some said that it was much more convenient, for example, than rolling a cigarette when they were outside. And some were just really pleasantly surprised with how well they got on with it. And the, the, the findings, the perceptions around vaping uh, in the vaping arm of the study, participants we spoke to was really, really positive. Um, there were some problems that were raised about the durability of device. Dropping devices was quite common and then and some devices would break and then it was having to deal with that. And, and some staff told us as well that some participants had issues refilling their e-liquids, some dexterity, manual dexterity problems with the safety caps. And they were staff were quite often asked to help out doing that, that kind of thing. And there's a really, um, 
really good point here was made by one of the participants. Um, and that's in the blue quote on the on the left. And she says, you know, if you're going to use a vape on a study with vulnerable and homeless people, pick a vape that the parts are more accessible. You know, just consider you've got to go online to get replacement parts. Most people don't have a bank account, let alone be able to go online. So these are things to consider if you're giving um, e-cigarettes to this, this population. Okay, and overall perceived value of the in intervention was incredibly high. The picture in the in the corner there, um, that's a participant's device that she loved so much she had filled colored in with love hearts. Um, and, and people told us that their, you know, their belief in e-cigarettes that was really, really strong. So even though they may not have managed to completely switch from smoking to, to vaping, um, there was a real belief. Um, that they would continue to vape, that they wanted to continue to vape, and in the future they, they might be completely successful. There was a real belief in that this was something that was going to carry on um, after the study. Um, participants really valued the increased knowledge about vaping and, and harm reduction, um, and people in the interviews told us that from vaping, the whole experience of the study and learning how, you know, vaping regularly, they just reported feeling healthier and better about themselves. And there's some quotes here from all different participants. You know, one says, I look in the mirror, see I'm progressing, I feel healthier, I'm not always having a cigarette. I feel proud of myself for the first time in ages. And, you know, it does give you confidence. It's made me think I can do something because my confidence has been knocked a lot. So overall, I mean, in conclusion then, the qualitative interviews gave some really good insight into lessons for future studies. So first of all, building trust and good communication and relationships are key. And this is kind of fundamental. And, you, and with this, you can overcome some of those barriers that I described at the, at the beginning. Um, as Lynn also said, we do need to consider cannabis use when designing interventions so it doesn't undermine the interventions. You know, I had one person um, that had stopped smoking completely using an e-cigarette. They were spending quite a lot of money on their, replay, on their refill pods for their device. This was in the usual care arm, funnily enough. Um, and, but he was still smoking some, uh, several joints a day. In his mind, he was a non-smoker, but when we did his CO reading, it was, it was incredibly, incredibly high and he got quite a shock um, about that. So it's making people understand as well um, what, what cannabis use means. Um, thirdly, it worked really well for us, you know, consider bringing smoking cessation aids and services to clients in their own environments. Um, you need to challenge assumptions about this group, misperceptions that they don't, they're not bothered about their smoking, that it's not a priority. That's not necessarily true. People are concerned, concerned about this, even though they have other things going on. Um, and carefully considered measures and questions. These are things that you're using your questionnaires, your baseline questionnaires and your follow-up questionnaires. You need to really carefully consider these to minimize the burden on participants and reduce areas of sensitivity. Um, and finally, that, that social context that was so important in the vaping arm, you know, can you capitalize on that peer influence to create a supportive vaping community or a supportive cessation community rather than that working against, against cessation efforts? Um, and ultimately, I think the main lesson is that there is a significant opportunity to engage these smokers in smoking discussions and treatment programs. And if it's designed right, then they're incredibly receptive to this. I did have one final slide that I wanted to just finish on. Um, the researchers kept diaries um, so that they could debrief and, and have a record of more some kind of challenging and sensitive issues that might come up, but also to record some more rewarding and positive experiences as well. So it, it, was, it was balanced in that way. And I have permission from the researcher to share this. Um, and I'm just going to read out this because it's a nice thing to end on. And, it, you know, she wrote, seeing a participant at the centre was always nice. We'd got to know each other a bit. He suffers from bipolar disorder and life had been a challenge. He had overcome heroin addiction and living on the streets. Doing his last follow-up was a joy as he was so positive about the study. I took his CO, that's your carbon monoxide reading, and when he saw he was in the green low numbers, he jumped for joy at his progress. He went looking for the service manager. I could hear him shouting, I'm in the green, I'm in the green. The manager and I laughed, we were so pleased. I thought that was a nice one to end because there were lots of rewarding experiences on the study. 
um, and just my final slides. So thank you again. I'll just repeat what, what Lynn said. So thank you to the full team, our advisory group, all the staff and our funder as well. Thank you very much. Alison, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, of course, Lynn, for uh, your presentation as well. Well, the great pair of presentations. I mean, it really is, um, you know, kind of public health is solidarity. Um, it's very, they were very moving, I thought. Um, we've got a couple of, uh, we've got five minutes to uh, deal with a couple of questions um, before we, um, and, and perhaps for anybody who feels the need for a comfort break to take a comfort break. Um, there are some questions about cannabis use that have been posted. Thank you very much for, for them. I'd like to hold them back till after Debbie's spoken and, and we'll confine ourselves to uh, questions specifically about the study. And Lynn, there were some interesting questions about uh, product choice, uh, product mm -hmm. testing, uh, why we didn't, I mean, I know right at the start that cheaper products are available. I'm not sure that that, that was being recommended for this trial, but just an observation that they were available uh, for people who might be more constrained financially. Um, and a question about the motivation uh, behind the choice of uh, e-cigarette brand. Yeah. Um, can we take those three as a bundle? Yeah, yeah, I can talk a little bit more about that. We did a lot of preliminary work even before we started the feasibility study. Um, so we we considered the choice of product very, very carefully. And obviously it was also dependent on what was available at that time. But what we did is we started by looking at all the products that were available. And obviously we wanted something that was a reasonable product that wasn't too expensive either, um, because we had to find the funding for this, as, of course, as well. Um, we wanted something that was what we know works fairly well, so not anything too cheap, not a cigar like something, but something that was very easy to use. So we kind of whittled that down to four, around four or five possible products, and then we did pilot those with people who were homeless. And we gave these out to various different people, and we collected feedback on that. Some of these products, this is something that was really interesting. We excluded some because they reminded people of crack pipes. I think it was the noise that they made and people were, you know, a couple of people actually said this, I just couldn't do that. It just reminded me of crack too much. So those ones were a complete no, no. Um, there were others where people just said it was far too fiddly. I just couldn't get the cap off. And many people in this population have problems with dexterity. So we really needed something that was dead easy to unscrew. And this particular device was easier to unscrew than some of the others. Some of the others also just had a, a glass tank that um, wasn't covered at all. Whereas the POCX was um, less likely to break compared to some of the others when it was dropped. So. That was why we chose the POC X. And um, I noticed somebody on the chat had said you can use vape bands, which I haven't heard of. So I presume that's some kind of rubber seal thing you can put around it. Um, but I would definitely look into that. And because we are putting in an application for a full 32 center, very large randomized controlled trial, we obviously need to consider the issue of the device again at this stage and review what is currently available on the market. And we've already started doing some PPI work around the device and whether we stick to the POCX or whether we use something else. Hopefully that answered all of those questions, Martin. Uh, testing and safety, are you... Um... Do you want to say anything about that? Testing and safety. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't tested the POC X in, in particular, but then again, it's not just the device. It's the device and how it's used and the e-liquid that's put in it. Um, so, but, but what we do know from other studies that have looked at e-cigarette safety and the types of emissions that are generated from vaping and biomarker studies where people have switched from smoking to e-cigarettes and then you can use, then you can look at metabolites of possible um, toxicants and carcinogens. Those types of studies collectively have shown that generally the exposure levels are far, far lower from e-cigarette use compared to cigarette smoking. So does that answer that one? I think so. And of course, the products were tested. Um, uh, so the products were notified to MHRA uh, as are all e-cigarettes available for sale. That's right, of course. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so we, uh, for those uh, people not in the UK, our medicines regulator uh, is also our e-cigarettes regulator. They have a separate system uh, where uh, there has to be, uh, products have to be notified uh, with a whole range of uh, tests uh, before marketing. There's a question there as well about uh, use of SMS and phone calls for support. Do you want to quickly address that? That's an interesting one, yeah, because most of our participants did actually have a mobile phone and they were happy to provide mobile phone contact details and that was the main the main way we kept in contact with people between appointments and we kept sending reminders. Um, so given that we know most people do have access to mobile phones, then you could feasibly um, send text messages for um, support to quit smoking and in fact as part of another study funded by the MRC we have just created a battery of text messages that are designed specifically to support smoking cessation through the use of e-cigarettes. Now lots of text messaging programs exist for generic smoking cessation but none are designed specifically to, to quit smoking through using an e-cigarette. And um, that's, that, that information is now available to other researchers. We have the, the, ba the, um, the batch of text messages available on the Chaos platform. So I can put a link in to share that with anybody who's, who's interested in using text message support specifically to help people quit using um, e-cigarettes. Well, look, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lynn, Alison, uh, you've got your, your mute. Is there anything you want to add or are you happy for us to move on? We can move on. I did see a question in the Q&A about um, staff and service users level of knowledge around e-cigs and vaping before the, do you want me to? Yeah, in? so I, well, I, I thought um, as Debbie was involved in the training, that might be something we might circle back to if we have time for the whole panel, do you think? Okay, um, okay that's uh, great. Uh, there are some other questions there about the study. Maybe uh, you two could get back to uh, the questioners directly uh, through the uh, type and answer uh, function. Um, so uh, now I think if um, if you're ready, Debbie will move on uh, to uh, Dr. Robson again. Debbie Robson is a, a colleague I've worked with for some years uh, with, and uh, always been de delighted by uh, working with her and her um, uh, enthusiasm and I think and her sensitive sensitivity to um uh people's uh real needs um she's done some amazing work from smoke free hospitals and of course on the uh e-cigarette reviews for public health uh england but uh, much much more than that um so debbie you're going to be talking about a specific project cr uk funded project integrating tobacco dependence support in substance use services um, I won't get in your way anymore. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'm just faffing with my screen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. Um, does my screen, screen look okay, Dean? Okay, fabulous, thank you. Just let me... Um, move this so I can't see myself. Um, so um, as Martin said, I'm, um, I'm a mental health nurse and I'm a, I'm a senior research fellow in the addictions department at, at King's College um, London. And we work closely with the South London and Maudsley um, NHS Trust. And I, I've been working, uh, been working in mental health for over, um, for over 30 years uh, and more recently got involved in, in supporting colleagues in substance use services um, to reduce harm um, from tobacco. Um, because historically, um, smoking has been seen as therapeutic and necessary by some mental health clients, some substance use clients, as well as clinicians and their families, despite there being a lack of um, empirical evidence. And the health risks um, of smoking are often seen as less relevant to the health risks of illicit substances and, and alcohol uh, in some people's minds. And again, historically, um, support to quit tobacco has not routinely been provided within substance 
substance use treatment services or community stop smoking services. Or it might be more accurate to say that we've not offered or provided uh, treatment in a way that's appealing and, and acceptable and meets the needs of these people. Um, when uh, people do get offered um, tobacco dependence treatment, um, the, many struggle to achieve similar success rates to the wider uh, general population. Um, and these people are often excluded from research studies, so we know less about these smokers than we do in the wider um, general population. So throughout my talk, I'm going to I'm going to talk about three people and their tobacco harm uh, reduction journeys. These are these are people that, that we we've worked with over the past couple of years. So we've got Jane, who's a mum of uh, four kids. Um, she attends a substance use service for um, treatment for heroin, although she's been abstinent for some years. So she's got a, a 22 year history um, of, of using heroin. Um, she's been off all the meds for the past two years. She smokes 20 cigarettes a day and she's tried to quit more than 30 times. Um, and the longest period was about four weeks and she's never vaped before. And then we've got John, uh, who uses heroin and crack and occasionally alcohol. And he's done that for 25 years. Uh, he's prescribed methadone and uses heroin on top occasionally. He's also got mental health problems. Uh, he smokes 40 uh, cigarettes a day uh, and he also vapes occasionally. And then we've got Janet, uh, who was in treatment for alcohol use, also got mental health problems. Um, she smokes 40 cigarettes a day, never tried to stop smoking before, never vaped. And I need to say these aren't uh, the real names of, uh, of these people. But they're quite typical, um, Jane and John and Janet, they're quite typical of the quarter of a million people uh, who are in contact with substance use services uh, in England. That's publicly funded substance use services in England. And this is the letter from Public Health England. So Public Health England do an absolute fantastic job in their data collection and, and an analysis of who's using services and what they're using in their treatment outcomes. Um, and so for many years, the, um, it's people who use opiates who, who make up um, the most of substance use services, followed by people with alcohol um, and then non-opiates and alcohol and non-opiates only. So Public Health England, what they do is um, they place people into substance use reporting groups. So anyone who uses opiates automatically gets put in the opiate group, regardless of whether they've got problematic um, other substance uses. And then for the non-opiates, we're talking about things like crack and, uh, and cannabis. So around 70% uh, of people that use the services are, are men, about 60% um, have some identified mental health treatment need and about 7% are homeless and about 11% um, have other housing uh, issue problems. Um, and for the past few years, uh, PHE has also been collecting the smoking rates uh, of people who use substance use treatment. So when they start their substance use treatment, um, smoking status is recorded alongside all the other substances. Um, and these, again, these are last year's rates, but they haven't really changed much um, since, since PHE started collecting this data. So um, throughout England uh, last year, people who use substance use services, 58% of them smoked. And that compares to around just under 14% in the general population. Um, people who use opiates, non-opiates, and non-opiates with alcohol have similar proportions um, of smoking prevalence. But only 3% of people of these 58% of the 49,000 were referred for smoking cessation support during their treatment for their primary substance use. So why does tobacco smoking matter amongst this population, um, apart from the fact that tobacco kills half of its users prematurely? Um, you know, if you've, if you've got a 
a substance use, you, you, you kind of don't escape that. Um, you, 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 your, your health um, is quite poor as well. And th this data comes um, from ASH. Uh, there's an annual cost to the NHS of providing uh, treatment for smoking related diseases of about two and a half million and of, of about 760 million to local authorities to provide care for people with smoking related diseases. Um, but specifically for people who use substances, and we've known this for um, decades, particularly people with alcohol uh, dependency, they've got a 51% risk of dying from their, their smoking related disease compared to a 34% risk of dying from alcohol causes. And that smoking and alcohol, although they're independent uh, risks uh, uh, for getting cancer, if you use them together, they, they act synergistically and they damage your health even further, particularly in terms of um, oral and office um, kind of uh, cancers of the esophagus. Uh, but also people who use opiates um, and smoke they're more likely to experience withdrawal discomfort from their opiate withdrawal and more intense opioid cravings um, than people who don't smoke or um, have never smoked or don't smoke through their um, opiate uh, withdrawal and treatment. And then just recently, um, a paper that Martin and I were involved in led by um, Brian Eastwood, a, a, a PhD. He took the data from um, Public Health England data um, and he, um, he assessed the reciprocal relationships between um, people um, who were in, in substance use services in England. Um, he looked at their smoking at the start of their treatment and their change in main, main drug use over six months and their main drug use at admission and their change in smoking over six months. And he did this with around 22,000 people with an opiate use disorder and about uh, 19,000 people with an alcohol use disorder and what he found was that the frequency of, of, of people's heroin use reduced significantly from 17 to 8 days a month but tobacco use stayed exactly the same and importantly once he controlled for all sorts of covariates higher smoking frequency at, uh, at the start of people's treatment was associated with a relative increase in opioid use at six months. And that was more or less similar for people with an alcohol use disorder. People's uh, frequency of alcohol use came down, um, but tobacco use only came down by uh, one day uh, per month. And the highest smoking frequency at admission was associated with an increase in alcohol use at six months. Um, so really, really important that tobacco use is addressed alongside people's other substance use uh, treatments. But this is often quite complicated and there's lots of barriers to this because people are concerned that trying to stop tobacco smoking may jeopardise recovery from uh, drugs of dependence or alcohol. Um, and there's this ingrained belief that smoking might be some kind of comfort and solace whilst you're detoxifying from, from, from your drugs. And this, this is constant kind of debate and uncertainty about whether tobacco cessation therapy, should it be offered during treatment for other drug dependencies or delayed until um, after recovery. And then there's the problems of the, the lack of knowledge and confidence to treat tobacco dependence and certainly lack of confidence amongst clients. Um, but mostly there's a general lack of opportunity uh, people are not given the opportunity to do this and also clinicians are often not given the resources or the funding um, to do this um, either. But uh, there, there is quite a bit of research on the effect of smoking cessation treatment in people with substance use disorders. So there's a, a Cochrane review published a few years ago that included 35 randomised controlled trials for this population involving in nearly 6,000 participants. And they found that nicotine replacement therapy or varenicline increased uh, your chance of stopping smoking. Um, combined counselling and, and, and uh, NRT or varenicline did, but counselling on its own didn't increase people's chances of quitting. Um, tobacco dependence treatment was effective for people in treatment and in recovery, 
for people with alcohol dependence and for people with other drug dependencies. And they concluded um, that tobacco cessation intervention should be integrated into clinical practice for people in treatment or recovery from drug dependence or alcohol. So I want to tell you about a piece of work that we've been doing for a number of years with a substance use service in, in, in South London. Um, so there's, there's six um, substance use services within the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, and the trust serves a local population of about 2 million. It's got four mental health hospitals. It's got about 200 community services, uh, 50 national services. Um, and um, it provides inpatient uh, mental health care for about 5,000 people every year. Um, and about 45,000 patients in the community. It no longer has any detox beds uh, and all the substance use services are community services offering tier two, tier three services. And what we've done for quite a few years now is taken um, a systems approach to supporting tobacco harm reduction in uh, the South London Morsi NHS Trust and the addiction services in, in, in SLAM uh, and the addictions department at King's, what we've done is work together to improve the, the infrastructure. Um, so buildings have been smoke free since 2009, grounds have been smoke free since 2014. Um, we've developed a tobacco dependence treatment service since 2014 and we've gone from four specialist tobacco dependence treatment advisors uh, to 12 last year and and recently as a result of the project i'm going to tell you about we've got a dedicated addictions tobacco dependence uh, treatment specialist we've got an electronic feral system to refer people for smoking cessation support and we do regular uh, patient and staff audits to understand people's smoking behavior uh, which i'll tell you about uh, in a minute we've got a, um, a treatment pathway that involves very brief advice easy access to evidence-based medicines behavioral and psychological support and we've had very supportive um, policies that allow the use of e-cigarettes on inpatient units and in community services. And we also have bespoke stop smoking clinics. We've had a staff training pathway for a number of years, so blended learning with e-learning and classroom based advanced skills training. And then what I spend a lot of time doing is understanding the barriers um, and facilitators of implementing smoke free policies and tobacco dependence treatment. So we've looked at things like, and this is all driven by what staff tell us in terms of what their concerns are. So their worries about lack of time uh, for providing support, figures, uh, figures about violence uh, would increase or, or that fires would increase. Um, on a, I, I'm not going to present that data, but uh, I, I can kind of reassure you people that violence actually decreases when you go smoke free and fires decrease when you open up your, e your, your smoke free policy to allow vaping um, on wards. But that's another presentation. So in terms of what we try and do is keep a close eye on the smoking rates from local services. So. And these are all done with questionnaires with with patients rather from rather than from electronic clinical health records. So back in 2005, 92% of people in substance use services smoked, um, whereas 87% smoked in 2013 and 83% smoked in 2018. So compared to the mental health clients in the trust, so we also um, surveyed them as well, their smoking rate stayed fairly stable uh, at around 55%. And that compares with the general population in London during those years, um, from 22% in 2015 to 14% in 2018. So you can see that there's massive disparities between substance use clients and the general population, but there's actually massive disparities between substance use clients and mental health clients. In terms of the proportion of people who wanted uh, support to quit or reduce smoking, there wasn't that many back in 2005, 27% of people who were surveyed said they were interested in quitting, compared with 79% of 
of substance use clients who wanted support in 2013 um, and around half in 2018. Uh, our most recent survey in 2018, we also started to survey people about their, um, their vaping behaviours. And what we found was that clients in substance use services were more likely to smoke, but less likely to vape compared with mental health clients. So we've got 66% of people smoking um, in uh, substance use services compared to 31% in mental health services. And then the people, mental health clients, were more likely to both smoke and vape compared with substance use clients. We also surveyed staff as well, because often, um, certainly kind of in, in, in my area of mental health, mental health staff often get criticised for their high smoking rates. Um, what we found with the mental health staff is that staff in substance use services were more likely to both smoke and vape compared to their mental health colleagues. Um, but again, so their smoking rates uh, amongst substance use service staff were higher than the general uh, population. But you can see kind of a big disparity between uh, staff and clients. There was absolutely no difference uh, in um, the device type, the flavours used, the nicotine strength between what substance use service patients used and mental health uh, patients uh, used. So the most popular device was a tank, the most popular uh, flavour was tobacco flavour, um, and the most popular, uh, most frequently used strength was 18 to 20 milligrams. Whereas in the wider general population, uh, the most common nicotine strength is around six milligrams, and the most popular flavours um, are fruit, although the most popular device type are tanks. So how do you integrate uh, a tobacco dependence clinic within a drug and alcohol service? So we, we, we've done a lot of work within our mental health settings, but we, we were lagging behind in terms of supporting substance use um, services. So this um, service um, takes place in, in Lambeth, in Brixton, which is, it just is a very diverse and, and colourful um, um, borough uh, of London. And drug and alcohol services, like many services in the country, um, are delivered by a consortium uh, of different um, providers. So Lambeth Service is led by South London Morsey and NHS Trust, and they work with uh, We Are With You, Humankind and Phoenix Futures. Um, and this is how the, the, the clinic, this, the, stop, the tobacco dependence treatment clinic um, has evolved over time. So back in, uh, back in 2013, when the trust did a survey uh, and found out smoking prevalence was really high and that many people wanted um, to quit smoking, but only 15% of people, only 15% of clients recalled ever being um, offered. Um, the opportunity to stop smoking. Um, this particular service set up a drop-in service and they brought in the specialist stop smoking advisor from the local community stop smoking service and they run a drop-in one day a week. Um, and then once she, she then trained up a couple of substance use workers and they took over the drop-in service um, and the drop-in could be um, on any uh, day of the week. Um, so the dropping could uh, it, it kind of increase from one day a week to five days a week. Um, so the, the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust um, provided um, support for that clinic. And then we were really fortunate enough, uh, fortunate enough to um, get some funding from Cancer Research UK um, to um, develop and evaluate a, 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 a clinic um, and, and extend this service. Um, and we changed it to, to a five day a week service and it was by appointment as well as drop in. And we had a dedicated tobacco dependence treatment advisor whose full time job it was just to treat people's tobacco dependence. Um, 
initially we thought we'd get a substance use worker to do this job, but no substance use workers applied for the post. And it was a mental health occupational therapist that applied for the post. And her salary uh, was paid for by Cancer Research UK. And then our our kind of evaluation study finished and, and when the advisor's salary ran out, um, the trust have continued to provide this service without any research funding. So the service has been um, sustainable. Um, the service just runs three days a week in this service, but two other two the other two days, she, uh, the, the Stop Smoking Advisor is also providing support to other parts um, of the trust. Up until December, 2018, it was the standard six sessions and people were offered NRT, Verena Clean and Behavioural Support and they were offered a free disposable e-cigarette from around 2016. Whereas with the Cancer Research UK funded study, what we did was double the length um, of sessions, uh, double the number of sessions. And ideally we wanted to see people weekly, but people could choose to space out their sessions depending on what was going on in their life. Um, and not a huge amount of people um, attended sessions weekly. A lot of people would kind of disappear for a while and then come back and then disappear um, again. Um, but we offered people NRT, Verena Clean and behavioural support. And the behavioural support included things like problem solving, um, troubleshooting, um, helping people to be adherent with their cessation aids uh, and carbon monoxide monitoring. And we expanded the range of e-cigarette products. So we offered people combination nicotine replacement therapy. We offered people um, a disposable e-cigarette. Um, uh, it, it's a product called um, eBurn and it's got 80 milligrams of nicotine per mil of e-liquid and it comes in two flavors. We offered people a choice, uh, um, uh, a tank model, the Pocket Suspire, which Lynn also used um, in her study. And we give people a choice of e-liquids and a choice of strengths, anything from three to 18 milligrams. And we also provided them with coils as well. And, and then finally, we offered people a closed system, uh, a nicotine salt pod device called a DOT. Um, and that only comes in one strength, 20 milligrams um, of nicotine per mil um, of e-liquid, and there's two mils in the, in, in the pod. And that comes in four flavors. And we, we bought the Pocket um, and the Dot from um, an independent uh, vaping manufacturer, Liberty Flights. And we bought the e-burns from an independent uh, vaping manufacturer called, um, well, uh, called e-burns. Um, and clients got to try out the products in their very first session, um, but they also got the opportunity to switch to a different product if the first product didn't suit them. Uh, but that was kind of within limits. People couldn't, you know, have 12 different types of, of you know, get a new e-cigarette at, uh, at the start of every session. Um, and, and the way we chose devices, now this was a, a question someone asked um, when Lynn was presenting. Um, we, we had a small group of um, clients from um, the Drug and Alcohol Service who tested several products for us. Um, so more products than, than we ended up giving them. Um, and they tried them out, they took them away and they, they settled on these particular um, devices. So it, it was very much led by the service users. And also what helped as well is um, we went along to, um, we worked closely with, with our local vape shop um, in Camberwell and, and find out what, what was the most popular starter kits used by um, local customers. And then the advisor would be able to phone up the vape shop, I, sorry for my appalling spelling on this slide, um, and be able to, to kind of troubleshoot and get some advice about, about vaping products. Um, and what they also did was um, that they, they were able to pr provide us with things like those protective um, rubber rings um, um, for the for, for the pockets. And what we also did, we 
so as well as the, the the stop smoking service, there was also kind of additional support in the background. So um, we did some staff training with the wider substance use team. Um, the tobacco dependence treatment advisor was brand new to smoking, so she had um, her level two training. And then I also ran a tobacco harm reduction support group for the staff uh, in the substance use team for six weeks. Um, and gave them an eight week supply of the same products that the service users were getting. So they all got a pocket uh, or a dot uh, and refills and behavioral support, group behavioral support. Uh, but we, we funded this um, in another way, not out of the CRUK grant. So the new clinic increased access to tobacco dependent support. Uh, everybody uh, wanted um, uh, a vape. Um, so 74 people accessed the, the stop smoking service over a 72 month period between August 2014 and July 2017, but over a 10 month pe period, 124 people accessed the service. Um, more people were referred, twice as many people were referred that could actually be seen because we only had one advisor. And so what we did was evaluated the outcomes amongst these 124 people just in a single arm before and uh, after studies. So there was there was no randomization. And in terms of the products people chose, 22 people um, had an e-burn, 70 had uh, a POCX and 60 had a DOT. Uh, and for those of you who can add up, um, you, you, you'll kind of work out that that doesn't add up to 124. Um, so one person uh, just opted for behavioural support, didn't want um, anything, um, and 29 people had more than one vaping device. And that was because they either struggled with their first devi device and wanted to switch, or they lost um, their original device and we replaced their devices. And also 71% uh, uh, of, of of, of clients also chose nicotine replacement therapy for part of their quit attempt, but this was mostly used for the first two weeks of their quit attempt and not throughout. So what did Jane and John and Janet choose? So Jane who'd never vaped before, she went for a POCX first of all, um, but after about a week she didn't like the feel of it in her hand, she said it was too heavy and she didn't like the pull on it. Um, so she switched to the dot and then she she broke the dot and then she it was replaced and then she lost her dot. Uh, and so she had a third dot and she still got a third dot after 18 months. Um, John um, was smoking and vaping at the start of treatment, um, but had uh, lost his vape, which was a... Um, a refillable tank device and he decided he wanted to try um, the dot um, and he stayed on it um, he, he he didn't get any um, additional products and he still got his original device after one year uh, Janet had never vaped before in fact she was anti-vaping uh, and didn't want to stop smoking um, but we um, we she was she was interested just to try the dot so she can give an opinion about helping her partner quit. Um, and she still got the dot um, after 14 months. Uh, information about uh, the, the, the clients generally. So the majority are men, which uh, is in keeping with substance use services. Average age is 45, 64% um, are white British and the rest are from uh, Black and Asian minority uh, ethnic groups. 26% um, were homeless, 64% uh, had a history of mental health condition, and they were smoking an average of 19 cigarettes a day, and their CO levels was 13. Um, the majority of people smoked roll your own tobacco or both um, manufactured uh, and roll your own tobacco. And I think about 78% uh, of them bought their tobacco and the rest got them from friends or um, illicitly. Um, 
roughly an equal number of people wanted to cut down or quit all in one go um, uh, or cut down then quit. Uh, there was a few people that just wanted to cut down and, and not quit smoking. Um, again, putting people into the, the kind of PHE defined substance uh, use groups, um, we had uh, half uh, the clients had an opiate use disorder. 22% had an alcohol only disorder. And then we had people in the alcohol uh, and opiates, non opiates, and non opiates only group. And then we've broken down just the opiate group there for you to see that people who use opiates don't just use opiates. So 62% of them were also using crack. 18% um, were using alcohol. Some were using cannabis uh, or powder cocaine. Um, benzos, amphetamines, uh, ecstasy. So th the majority of these pe people, probably with the exception of the alcohol only group, are uh, um, uh, kind of multiple poly drug users. Um, half of them smoke their primary or secondary or tertiary drug, and 58 of them also smoked cannabis as well, but weren't necessarily getting treatment uh, for cannabis. Um, 27% were abstinent from their primary drug at the start of their tobacco dependence treatment, whereas the majority were still using drugs and um, um, were still being treated for their primary drug use when they started their uh, tobacco uh, dependence support. So 19 people came along, uh, got an e-cigarette and were never seen again. But 84% or 85% attended two or more sessions. So we classed them as, uh, as people who engaged with the service. The average number of sessions that people came to was six and 24% of people attended all sessions. 75% of, of, of everybody um, no, that's it can't be everybody. So that would be 75% of the 105 who attended two or more sessions um, said that e-cigarettes were easy to refill uh, and recharge. Um, and then we broke it down by those who attended four, eight and 12 sessions. So 69% of people found the e-cigarette helpful or very helpful in helping them cut down their tobacco. Um, compared to 32% of people who found NRT helpful. That was um, at four sessions. Um, at eight sessions, 82% found the e-cigarette um, helpful compared to 16% who found NRT helpful. And those who attended the 12 sessions, 16, 60% found uh, e-cigarettes helpful compared to 13% who found NRT helpful. And then you can see kind of how satisfying e-cigarettes were compared with tobacco cigarettes. So it was about a third of people in uh, by the fourth session uh, and then 40% of people at eight and 12 sessions. So overall number of cigarettes smoked today went from 19 um, to 6.5 two cigarettes per day in the whole group. So that includes everybody who dropped out um, um, by their last appointment. Um, the people who attended two or more sessions, um, cigarette smoke per day went down to 3.6. So there was quite a, a significant difference in number of cigarettes smoke per day between baseline um, and last appointment. There was also a significant difference in carbon monoxide levels as well. Uh, so down to 9.1 uh, in 112 people who provided a CO uh, reading at last appointment, or 8.3 in those who attended um, two or more sessions. These are seven day point prevalence quit rates. Um, we do have continuous abstinent rates, but we, we literally have just finished analysing the data uh, this morning for this presentation. So I haven't haven't got to them yet. But the, the blue bars, these, they're the intention to treat group. So that's everybody who came to one session. That's the 124 people. Uh, the, the orange bars are the people that had two or more sessions, 105 people, and then the complete cases. 
Um, and I forgot to put the number um, on there. I think it's around 80 ish. Um, so you can see that um, quit rates varied across sessions. So this isn't necessarily a, a four weeks follow up, eight weeks follow up, 12 weeks follow up. Um, we, we went for um, taking cessation rates at, uh, by the number of sessions people had because people were just, people weren't coming weekly. Pe people were kind of spacing out um, their appointments quite, quite a lot. And then these are the reduction rates. So again, um, they vary. So kind of from the, the complete cases, um, at four weeks, there's a 62% reduction uh, of cigarettes per day by, fifth, by at least 50% uh, are more relative to, to baseline, down to 40% um, at, uh, at session 12. And again, these are seven day point prevalence quit rates. In terms of breaking down quit rates by substance group, um, what we see is that 85% of people in the opiate group either quit or reduced by their last appointment. 92% in the alcohol group quit or reduced by their last appointment. Everybody in the alcohol and non-opiate groups either quit or reduced by last appointment. And 77% in the non-opiate group either quit or reduced. So how did Jane and John, uh, and I forgot, I forgot Janet, I couldn't forget Janet. Um, so Jane, if you remember, used the dot. She managed to quit for six months and now occasionally smokes and vapes. She's still abstinent from all her primary drugs. And the outcomes that mattered most to Jane, as, apart from stop smoking, was that she breathed much better. Um, everybody I spoke to said they breathe much better. Um, and it also mattered to her that she saved money. And for John, who used the dot, he quit smoking for uh, 12 months and he's still vaping. Uh, he's still on his methadone and he uses uh, heroin on top, but uh, much less frequently. And he used to, um, he used to smoke uh, uh, tobacco as well as um, smoking heroin. And often, um, at late at night, he would have to leave the house uh, looking for dog ends to make up a tobacco cigarette to either use whilst he was smoking heroin because it increased the buzz uh, and made the heroin last longer um, or to use the ash for uh, his crack pipe to have a, as a kind of suspension device to um, put the crack on top. He no longer does that. Um, so when he does occasionally use um, heroin on top of his methadone, which is infrequently, he vapes. And for Janet, Janet was a very, Janet was a bit of an accidental quitter. Um, having been such an anti-vapor, she decided she really liked the dot um, and she quit smoking uh, for 12 months. She's also quit vaping. She's still abstinent from alcohol. And what mattered uh, to Janet most is that um, apart from, uh, so smoking is no longer triggering a drinking. And she no longer feels guilty or ashamed that she's a uh, smoker. And all the people I've spoken to, because we're also doing a qualitative uh, uh, evaluation to this as well, without exception, everyone has talked about feeling guilty and ashamed about smoking. And this is this is in a group. This is a, a, in a group of, of of substance users. All felt ashamed and guilty about smoking. So clients feedback, and this is generally across the people I've spoken to, is they've all talked about the product, the e-cigarette. And what's, what's been common across the people I've spoken to is that they've been really appreciative and grateful that we've given them quality products. And, and one chap said to me, it's great that you didn't give me a cheap one off the Brixton market. These, these are top quality. And, and quite a few people have said that. A number of people uh, have talked about the place or being in the same place to where I was seeing my alcohol counsellor was absolutely um, vital for this patient because he was he was confident that that um, people uh, knew him and 
if someone was was seen in with, within a drug and alcohol service, he knew he could trust them. Uh, and he said they were cautious. Um, in terms of the person, th there's been various feedback about some people were absolutely ready to give up um, smoking because it was the last thing to go. Um, they'd been able to kick everything else. And then for other people, they didn't think they would have been able to consider it while they were still drinking. Um, but what was what was consistent with all the feedback was the importance of the advisor. Uh, and I want to give a shout out uh, to the tobacco dependence treatment advisor, Georgia White, because of everyone I've spoken to, there was so much love for her uh, from clients. Um, and they all said, you know, she, she gave me time to talk about my life. Sometimes we didn't talk about smoking. Um, and she never rushed me. And everybody said um, that they felt heard. And, and, and some people said they felt seen as well for the first time. Um, and quite a few people have, have said it saved their life. Being able to stop smoking, they really believe has saved their lives. And they're so proud of themselves. So my top tips for integrating tobacco harm reduction, my spelling's appalling on this, I'm really sorry. Um, offer tobacco dependence treatment to all clients, um, regardless if they're abstinent from the primary drug use and let the client decide if the time's right for them and meet people where they're at. No one single e-cigarette device, flavor or nicotine strength is gonna suit all clients. So. If possible, if you can get the funding, offer a choice of closed and open systems and flavours and strengths. And allow people to change the e-cigarette device if it doesn't suit them. And if clients want to reduce harm, but they're in a very chaotic period, then offer disposable e-cigarette devices until they become more stable. But don't overwhelm people uh, with choices. Don't give them multiple devices to try at the same time, just one at a time get them to experiment and, and, and feedback to you. And think about the barriers uh, that a client might face when using a particular device. So if people are still using alcohol and it's likely they're gonna be drunk at some time or withdrawing from substances, filling a tank style uh, device and taking care of your coil might be a challenge. So a closed pod system might be more suitable. Make sure you've got an educated, engaged workforce uh, around you. And I can't stress this enough, a dedicated tobacco dependence treatment advisor who works in and alongside substance use workers is so important. And use your local vape shop um, as a resource. The NCSCT have produced some great guidance on how to work with vape shops. So finally, uh, my final piece of advice, uh, and I say this whenever I'm doing training, never, ever, ever give up on a client who wants to stop smoking or a client who doesn't want to stop smoking because you can always pique their interest. And just be persistent. Um, you need to persist, be persistent. Your client needs to be persistent and just try in different devices, flavors, strengths, but also licensed nicotine replacement therapy. Um, you'll eventually find the right combination and never, ever, ever leave anybody behind. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you so much to um, the people uh, at Lorraine Hewitt House and the South London uh, Morsey NHS Trust, uh, to my colleagues at King's, to Cancer Research for funding the study, to colleagues at Liberty Flights and Eburn, uh, where we purchased the e-cigarettes, uh, to my friends in the vape shop, and to the clients at Lorraine Hewitt House um, for sharing their wisdom with me. Thank you very much. Debbie, thank you very much for such a, a great talk. Now, if I can invite the uh, form the previous speakers back onto the virtual panel, and um, the uh, Mots will invite two additional members of the panel, uh, the panel who I will introduce in just a second. Um, but also, I was supposed to uh, announce a, a quick poll that we were going to do three times. We thought that we cook this up less than five minutes before the start of the session. We have a quick poll for you to do. Dean, are you able to uh, 
uh, put up the poll and make that happen in any way that you do that? Marvelous. Uh, quick question, click yes or no. And maybe if we have time, we'll come back and do this uh, again at the end of the session. Hosts and panelists cannot vote. It says. Okay, so while you all click away at that and ponder the uh, question, uh, there were no specific questions, Debbie, uh, on your talk, so you've dodged a bullet there. Um, we had quite a number of questions about uh, cannabis use uh, in the first uh, session um, in Lynn and Allison's, uh, in response to Lynn and Allison's pre uh, presentation. I held back the questions because I knew that this would be an issue that would feature in your um, uh, in your talk, uh, and I am reminded that <laughs> back in the day when I used to do stop smoking uh, work in Soho pubs, uh, we used to run stop smoking groups and above above pubs. Um, we uh, we were clear that you couldn't smoke, but we did have recipes for other ways of uh, using cannabis uh, because our focus was entirely on smoking cessation. Um, so maybe we'll answer those questions, but before we do, uh, let me, uh, in, well, I, I was gonna say, let me introduce Louise Ross. I'm not gonna do, why would I introduce Louise? There's no point, everybody must uh, know who Louise Ross is. Um, if, if you're one of the, if you're the one person on the call who doesn't, uh, then Louise Ross uh, is a legend, she, um, I used to run the Stop Smoking service in Leicester, uh, famously made it e-cigarette friendly, uh, has since, um, uh, since you formally retired, uh, the busiest retirement I've ever seen. Uh, she's been doing all sorts of work with NCSCT, but uh, for the new Nicotine Alliance, not because she's a vapor, but because I think, again, this is a solidarity thing. She sees how uh, vaping has changed people's lives. Um, we're all kind of uh, day trippers to the field of uh, homelessness, uh, but uh, Robin, uh, Robin Burgess, Chief Executive uh, Hope, uh, lives it every day. We're going to be uh, moving, I think, very quickly onto a, a question about uh, COVID and COVID response um, and uh, how getting homeless people uh, off the streets and into some kind of uh, residence has uh, interacted with their drug and uh, alcohol and tobacco use. Um, Robin was telling me that uh, that program kicks off again uh, today uh, with at the Hope Centre. So, um, if I may first ask the, uh, the cannabis question, particularly to Lynn, Alison, and Deborah, and then uh, Louise and, and uh, Robin might want to also offers some observations. So should we be offering uh, advice to quit cannabis? Is it necessary to quit cannabis? Can we just recommend other ways of using cannabis? Uh, are we failing them by not uh, offering um, uh, support to quit cannabis? Uh, are we to not not um, rec recognizing enough the kind of the way cannabis uh, relapse and smoking relapse interact, unpick all that stuff. Do you want me to start? Yes, Lynn, I would like you to start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we saw in, in our study, I mean, in Debbie's study as well, cannabis smoking is exceptionally high amongst people in, in these groups. Um, but we have to meet people where they are. I mean, Alison's quotes illustrated that, you know, many people saw this as kind of the last thing they're doing and they were still getting a lot of pleasure from it. Cannabis vaping, of course, is um, uh, a viable, um, well, when I say viable, it, it's a harm reduction approach, um, given that we know most of the harms of smoking cannabis come from the burning process. Um, so just like other harm reduction approaches, if we can offer cannabis in an alternative form which reduces exposure to harmful and potentially harmful toxicants and carcinogens then you know that that could be a way to go um there's so many issues around 
doing this though. Um, and I think, you know, we can't just progress straight to a, a randomized controlled trial offering people cannabis vaping equipment as an alternative. First of all, we need to know, is it acceptable to people? Maybe people like smoking cannabis because that offers them the buzz, the high, the pleasure, the relax relaxation that they need. Can that still be achieved through um, different types of cannabis vaping products? What product could feasibly use. It's also, um, we've got to consider the legality issues here as well, staff acceptance, client acceptance. So I think um, in theory, it's you know a, a really good idea to try and get people to switch if they want to, and if it, if it uh, works for them. But I think before we can go down that route, we need to talk to staff about this. Um, staff were amenable to a harm reduction approach in our study as part of our training. People were very reluctant about e-cigarettes to start with. And of course, they'd heard all the, the news stories that they're just as harmful as smoking and so on. But once we explained to people that e-cigarettes are far less harmful than tobacco smoking and that they are a harm reduction product, people got that. So I think, you know, the same could be done with cannabis vaping. I mean, personally, I'm not aware of um, like product, you know, information about products and how cheap and how readily available and the logistics around it, but it's definitely, it's definitely an issue and definitely something I think that's worth exploring. It would just be, there's just a lot of things to take into consideration before we can move to doing a full trial. So those are my thoughts anyway. Thank you very much, Lynn. Alison, is there something you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just that's a, a really helpful overview from Lynn and all those points are, you know, they're, they're, they really do need further exploration. I think that's the only way to take this really is that we need to do a lot, uh, give this a lot more thought. I have worked on a number of vaping studies now um, where people have chosen to do this themselves alongside the study. And I'm thinking just, to have, it's only in my experience, a handful of people I've worked with that have done this, um, but they have, in addition to, you know, the kit that we've given them and the e-liquid we've given them off their own back, they've gone and purchased CBD e-liquid to put in their, in their vaping devices. And they've done that themselves. They've chosen the products. Again, we can't give any, we would never give any input into that because we wouldn't know what, what to suggest even. Um, and, and, and just, you know, kind of anecdotally that there were some mixed results around that. I think the, you know, some people thought it was better than nothing and, and other people just thought it, it just didn't fulfill what they were looking for when they were smoking their cannabis. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a, an area that needs further investigation. Uh, so uh, crudely put then, CBD is the legal extract from cannabis, which is the kind of calming uh element uh and thc uh is the more kind of um uh, buzzy uh bit which is prohibited in the uk uh but uh, permitted in some cases in the us and um so that might be kind of sounding alarm bells for people thinking about the uh evaluate uh experience uh a little over a year ago in the us when um vaping with vitamin E acid, uh, vaping THC with vitamin E acetate was uh, found to be the major cause of um, the, the Valley outbreak. Debbie, have you got anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so in, in the drug and alcohol service where we did the evaluation, substance um, support for reducing or stopping cannabis is part of uh, a substance use worker's role if a patient wants support to reduce their cannabis as well as their, their other substances. So the tobacco dependence treatment advisor wasn't helping people to give up cannabis if they wanted to continue cannabis, but worked with them to reduce their tobacco use either when uh, mixed with cannabis or their separate um, their separate uh, manufactured cigarettes they, they, they were smoking. And what we found is quite a few people managed to, to stop their um, manufactured cigarettes but, uh, and reduce the, the amount of tobacco in their cannabis. But um, 
as as people know in the UK that the the type the strain the type of cannabis people buy um, off the streets is is quite potent in the UK. So a lot of people felt that if they took the can if they took the tobacco out of the cannabis, it just would be too strong um, for them. Um, and then we also I I chaired a um, organised and chaired a meeting. Um, when you could do that face to face um, with our local stop smoking advisors and vape shop staff and one of um, who's an expert cannabis researcher, Amir England um, at the Institute of Psychiatry, um, just to, to, to exchange some information because the local vape shop staff were telling us they were having a lot of success with people switching to vaping CBD. Uh, and not smoking cannabis. So we wanted to try and find out what were, what was kind of uh, the vape shop workers experience and how that might influence some research that we do in the future. Um, but what our um, cannabis expert believed was that um, the, the, the strength of CBD um, sold in vape shops in the UK uh, is more at placebo doses um, rather than any, you know, anything that might help people so there was it was an interesting meeting though because there was lots of uh, sharing of opinions and, and exchanging of information from people kind of um who who were talking to to people who, who were vaping cbd on a regular basis but definitely I'm, worth studying further i'm reminded of uh, a friend of mine who was very uncomfortable about knowing you know me smoking in the relationship with me and uh, they said uh, well look, good news martin i've, I've completely uh, stopped smoking cigarettes i still smoke joints but i don't smoke cigarettes anymore um and they were smoking about six or seven joints a day but the good news was they were putting hardly any cannabis in the joints mm. took me a while to work that one out i think they were smoking six or seven cigarettes with Waste with cannabis. Anyway, um, Dean, uh, you've got your the, the results to our our survey. Our survey said, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to be able to shift that bend, bend that dial very much." Uh, okay, thanks all for that. I'm not going to bother coming back to uh, ask that question again. Instead, um, uh, I'm going to start the next question, but uh, with uh, Robin and then Louise. Uh, you might, oh, uh, Robin, I. Sorry, Louise. Uh, I, yes, Louise. Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to add to the, the cannabis question. So um, I was going to I was going to say join in with the cannabis question, but okay. uh, well, <laughs> but 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 let me kick off uh, with the the whole uh, COVID everybody in uh, experience, um, Robin. So you know if if I've got this right, on last spring in lockdown one. Uh, something I think we did right in England was to uh, get people off the streets. But in order to make uh, you know these hotels somewhere where people wanted to be, we had to accommodate uh, some of their other behaviours. But you know, as public health people, we wanted to um, you know give them on, an opportunity to change those behaviours. Uh, what was your experience then uh, with smoking and? vaping and drinking and drug use and as a complicating factor and uh, how and here you are again on day one of um, everyone in two. Yeah I mean it would be fair to say that um, particularly cannabis is one of the most intractable problems for any kind of setting where you've got people having to stay inside or in some cases having to self-isolate. Uh, we've actually currently got quite a big outbreak for COVID in quite a large hostel for the homeless and getting people to stay inside and isolate when they have considerable cannabis habits is far more challenging than managing their opiate habits, for example, uh, because of course you can organise their scripts to be brought to the door, but you can't necessarily organise their cannabis to be brought to the door, so their intention to go, to go out is greater. Um, I mean, clearly, it provides an opportunity within everyone in to address all of people's addictive behaviour, including smoking. Um, I know that practice varied around the country. I know that Deborah was involved in helping to support uh, smoking cessation in her setting in London. Um, I'm not sure that happened in every setting. It didn't happen in ours the first time, although I'm very pleased to say it will be happening the second time 
uh, now that everyone in is happening again here in Northampton tonight. Uh, so we will be trying to organise some smoking cessation as part of that. Um, but it all should be part of it. Just as your poll has said, there is enormous support for having smoking cessation seen as a priority alongside dealing with the other addictions that people face. Uh, and it does provide us with a good opportunity. And interesting, because of course, cannabis smoking uh, is prohibited under our smoke-free legislation indoors as well. Uh, I knew that some of the hotels, in theory, some of the hotels might have rooms where smoking is permitted. That's allowed within the legislation. Did that, was that a feature? Did it help or did it just cause confusion? <laughs> it's also worth pointing out that not everybody uses hotels all the time, and this time it may well be student accommodation. So the rules may not be entirely the same. Hmm. It's enormous vari variety across the country. Louise, what about, uh, you, you had an answer about the cannabis question. I wonder if you also have thoughts about uh, the opportunities or uh, pitfalls in the Everyone In programme. Well, I, I was going to say um, broadly that uh, NCSCT has just produced um, some guidance for stop smoking practitioners and other healthcare professionals about cannabis use. Um, because one of the one of the issues that we see is that um, sometimes people don't count, you know, as, as you rightly said, they don't count cannabis as smoking. They, they, you know, they say they've stopped smoking, but they're actually still using using cannabis. But we, we see this in the services quite a bit that, um, uh, you know, shisha you know, isn't counted as smoking, but we know it is. Um, uh, herbal cigarettes even, you know, sometimes people will say to us, it's all right, you know, I've stopped the tobacco cigarettes, I'm, I'm using those nice herbal cigarettes now. So, so a lot of the decision making uh, amongst users um, can be improved by explaining you know that that smoking anything is is what does the harm and and once people actually know that there are different ways of, of getting cannabis um and helen redman i see is is um you know popping up um comments about this you know edibles um the the, the ncsct guide talks about edibles instead you know which which can you know be a you know a very good alternative for some people i i, I did go to a talk about um vaping cbd where it said that you know, of all the things you can do with CBD, vaping is probably the, you know, the most useless way of, of actually taking it in. So, um, you know, maybe maybe that's something that, uh, you know, should be noted as well. Debbie, have you anything uh, to, because you were involved, I remember we were kind of emailing each other frantically in the spring about how to facilitate a, a vape offer for people um, in the anyone, Everyone In uh, initiative. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, there was a new homeless drug and alcohol pan London service set up um, at the end of March. So I supported colleagues uh, in SLAM uh, with their tobacco harm reduction activities in 14 Greater London Authority hotels. So um, supplying um, e-cigarettes and licensed nicotine replacement therapy to all the uh, hotels and um, trying to engage staff kind of very quickly in conversations uh, about why it might be a good idea um, to provide uh, nicotine replacement for people who were having to isolate in their rooms um, all the time and prevent people from congregation outside uh, hotels close together sharing cigarettes as it as it as is common uh, uh, amongst that population um, and we've we've done some formal evaluation in one hotel uh, and we've done some some qualitative work uh, in some other hotels and it's it's been generally um, the intervention's been generally well received um, and there's, there's been a, a lot of gratitude um, to, um, to, you know, people for the very first time have tried e-cigarettes that, you know, they've never been able to afford them before or, or maybe were quite suspicious about it. Um, so we, we provided them with closed systems. We provided them um, with nicotine uh, salt pods. Um, we decided not to go for the tank open systems because staff weren't able to help people set up 
the system and help with priming coils and changing coils and so um we went for something very very kind of simple and easy that that people that were new to vaping just could um start uh, with so and that's something we continue to do now so we've been supply um hotels have remained open um for emergency housing in hotels since the end of march so we've continued to supply those hotels and and we'll be doing until the end of uh, june this year interesting um i <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted because um, there's a wealth of questions uh, in the box about uh, uh, cannabis smoking, cannabis harm reduction, uh, which isn't really the topic of uh, today's session. Um, I have a, a chair's question, which is um, kind of related, but um, I, I think I. I feel the need for a quick go around uh, the panel about thoughts on uh, just re whatever reflections you want to offer on uh, harm reduction for cannabis users. Uh, if you want, this isn't the topic of the, uh, the session. We have had lots of questions. So if you want to pass, then by all means pass. Um, Debbie, do you want to go first? Do you, have you any thoughts on uh, harm reduction strategies for cannabis use? Um, I mean, again, I'd refer to um, the NCSCT guidance on the recent one that, that um, uh, Hannah Walsh and colleagues uh, just worked on. Um, what we tend to do in local substance use services is just look at less harmful ways of using cannabis, like cooking with it or you know, making... Uh, butters out of it and uh, cakes and things like that um, but you know reminding people that um, the effects of, of eating cannabis uh, uh, take a bit longer to kick in than maybe smoking cannabis or you don't want to kind of overuse things so we did we, we talk to people about just alternative ways than setting fire to your cannabis um, including vaping cannabis Yes. So my understanding is that uh, the cannabis might, uh, it's hard, a little harder to titrate your cannabis use if you're uh, with edibles because um, it takes longer for it to be metabolized or to, to come into the system. And, and so you might um, not be able to get that fine tuning that you might be used to if you're, uh, if you're used to smoking. There are inhaled options, I guess, as well. Uh, you know, the commercially available cannabis liquids, but also uh, I think somebody was commenting on the conversation, in the, the, the chat section about just heating cannabis. Lynn, do you have any reflections you want to offer on cannabis harm reduction? Nothing else to add other than, you know, what Debbie said and what's already been said, that if people want to, if people have a concern about their cannabis use, anything that other than burning it, because burning is the worst thing you can possibly do. So, Bad for your so health, but also might you know all wrapped up in the nicotine uh as well if you're using if you're using tobacco to yeah but just burning anything is going to be exposing you to high levels of carbon monoxide which is obviously very harmful yeah and particulate matter and high temperatures etc Alison, anything you want to add not really. I guess I'm just thinking at it from a researcher's point of view and working on studies with participants. And if this is a, something that they desire, that they want to somehow reduce the harm from their can cannabis consumption, then, you know, it's up to us to, you know, get the information and be able to confidently recommend what, what some solutions might be to that. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a learning point for us all going forward, I think. Robin. No, I've absolutely nothing to add about cannabis. I think we really do need to talk about the really good things in terms of the studies about the effect on smoking cessation that the two research studies came up with and not speculation about the potential value for cannabis. There may be there, maybe not. But these were both research studies and studies of practice as well in homelessness settings and with substance users about what could be achieved. And there's really good stuff there. A very useful uh, prod there, Robin. Um, Louise had a hand up uh, there for a second. Was there one last comment you want to make? I think I think the the, the cannabis uh, topic is almost closed. We, I think we're shrugging and saying, you're, 
interesting questions. You're asking the wrong people. Um, we don't have the data. Uh, Louise, anything you want to add before we No, move on? no, I was, I was simply unmuting myself, ready for you asking me, Martin. And, <laughs> and if we want to move on to, um, you know, the, 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 the studies that, uh, that have been talked about so very eloquently, I, I loved all the presentations. You know, I, I wrote down, you know, when you give people what they want, more people will come. And this, this, that, that for me is the essence of the work that, that all the researchers have done. That, you know, instead of forcing people down a route of, of what they don't want, what they might have tried before, what they're not interested in, give them something that they actually want and they will respond. So there was one question in there about uh, whether we have high enough um, uh, nicotine levels in the uh, in the UK products to uh, satisfy uh, heavily addicted smokers. Uh, my hunch is that Lynn might have some thoughts about that. Um, uh, but on Louise's point about um, uh, it's the acceptability, what's your feeling from your, the data and your, the experience about the importance of uh, strength, flavor, flexibility, appeal, uh, who, uh, Lynn, you want to go I was going to go, let's go round with everybody because I think everybody has something to contribute on, on this one. Lynn? Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's just, I mean, as Debbie is so eloquently described, there's not a one size fits all. Um, with regards to the nicotine strength, with our study, we went for the two higher strengths that are available in the UK, the 18 milligram per milliliter and the 12. Um, now, my personal feeling is that these these levels might not be high enough for some of the most dependent smokers, but it very much depends on the device setup because you obviously you don't need such a high nicotine concentration if you've got a very high powered device and a low atomizer resistance. But if you're using a simpler product with um, a, a weaker battery, for want of a better term, then you do need those higher nicotine levels. So I think actually for some people, they probably would need higher nicotine strengths, especially if they're using um, a less sophisticated product. And many people don't want to use some of the most sophisticated products because you know they, they just want something dead easy that's, that's as simple as possible. However, saying that, we did find in our study with smokers experiencing homelessness that actually some people said the 18 was too much and some people did want even lower than the 12. Um, so we just need to offer people um, a range of choices and see what works for them. Alison, what did the call data tell us about that? Yeah, so it said exactly what Lynn just said. So we did have a, a number of people who said that the, the stronger strengths were, were just too much for them. And also, I think there's a worry among people when you when they, you know, when they hear, well, this is the strong one. Um, and, and again, it's all that, you know, misperceptions about nicotine and vaping and harm. And it's all of that stuff comes through as well. So people think it's better for them to vape a lower strength. I think that's a misperception because obviously that might not be as satisfying for them. Um, but yeah, quite a, quite a number of them came back and, they were, and then these were heavy smokers. Um, you know, they came back saying it that the, the 18 and the 12 even was too, was too strong for them. And were you picking up negative uh, perceptions of e-cigarettes strongly uh, in, the, um, in the qual data? Were people, did people have concerns? Yeah, so when, when in any of these studies where we speak to participants, we'll always say, what did you initially think? What did you used to think? What did you think at the beginning when you heard about, you know, trying e-cigarettes? And, and it's quite consistent across studies. And I think this probably reflects the general mood of the general population is that people are anxious about them. And there is a proportion of people who still think they're as harmful as, 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 as cigarettes and or even more harmful than cigarettes. And when you speak to people, you hear all the media stories filter through. Or, I heard this and my friend said this and exploding devices and popcorn learn and that, you know, people still hold on to those stories. Um, but that, that this is why when you do studies with with participants, this is why the, the information you give them is so important. It has to be accurate and there has to be buy in and trust from them um, into into the information that you're, you're giving them. Because, um, yeah, those misperceptions still exist. And that, that that's really interesting. Um, uh, and the way things, <laughs> popcorn long features in the in the popular consciousness 
in the absence of any sensible uh, evidence. But Debbie, you so you again you started off a study which was designed giving people a choice of different uh, products. What's your view uh, on uh, the importance of? I feel like this is a stupid question uh, on the importance of choice and uh, appeal. I think it's it's absolutely essential, and and, and if we don't do it, we, we we're doing people a big disservice. Um, but I know it's it's easier said than done, um, because I don't think the if we hadn't managed to get some money from Cancer Research UK to to support uh, widening access to, to different types of e-cigarette products. I'm not sure um, it, it, it would have happened initially uh, when, it, when it did in that particular service. Um, simply be, you know, because, because of the cost, because of the cost to, 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 to health services, when this is essentially still a consumer product. Um, um, and there's, there's still a lot of resistance within health services and amongst health professionals um, and a lot of misperceptions um, about e-cigarettes and vaping um, that, that we still got to address. Um, so I can, I can only go on, on the experience of, of talking to, to people, you know, patients and um, and they, they just wouldn't have, so quite a lot, I think about 60% of people had vaped before uh, in this study, but none of them had stuck with vaping because they, they hadn't, you know, the, they might have tried one product and then couldn't afford to go, you know, and, and didn't like it, but then couldn't afford to go and buy a different type of product um, or, you know, couldn't afford to go and, you know, experiment with flavors and and with nicotine strengths, like a lot of people who vape in the wider general population, they, they just don't have the financial capital to do that. So the fact that we purposefully and deliberately give people choices, um, we can we can see that's that that's effective, um, and we wouldn't have got as many quitters or reducers if we we just stuck with one product. Change of tack, Debbie. We've had a question about unintended consequences. When you brought in the smoke-free uh, policy at uh, SLAM, you were very alert to various unintended consequences. Uh, were you looking, were you open to the possibilities of unintended negative uh, consequences uh, using e-cigarettes in your group? And did you observe any? So we asked people at every session, um, if you put anything else in your vape, if you put any illicit substances um, in your vape, uh, and only one person out of the um, uh, the whole sample admitted they'd put some um, cannabis uh, product in their vape, but we didn't. Nobody else um, reported uh, any unintended consequences. There was there was very few side effects, just the usual things about you know coughing and a dry mouth and an initial sore throat that, that reduces over time the longer people um, vape. Um, we had loads more positive results that I didn't have time to present and particularly about people's respiratory health significantly improved, their wheezing improved, their coughing improved over time. Um, and that's something that's quite important to, to this particular population and, and to, to, to um, the people that um, Lynn's been working with is because they've got really, really poor respiratory um, health, uh, not just from their smoking, but from smoking other drugs as well, their, um, their heroin um, and their crack. Um, so anything we can do to improve their respiratory health is a bonus. Interesting. And so Lynn and Alison, so thanks to Emma Ray for that question on unintended uh, consequences. There was a second part to that, which is about um, a kind of uh, wider unintended consequences, negative judgments, uh, perhaps uh, negative media coverage. Uh, Lynn and Alison, did you encounter either um, unintended cons negative consequences at an individual level or at the level of the study? Did you get flack for the study? 
Um, Lynn first, then Alison. I think Alison's probably in a better position to answer this as she worked directly with many of the clients and the staff, whereas I didn't. Um, but um, it depends what unintended consequences you're talking about. And we had a questionnaire, um, as Debbie did in her study, about adding any substances to the device that we gave, and, and nobody did report that um, in our study, although one person reported they'd added some THC to a different device. Um, but Alison may be able to answer that better. Alison? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Nobody did report in using it in the device that, or using any other substances in the device we gave them. There was the one person who had used something in a different device. Um, but anecdotally, when we kind of discussed this a bit more in the qualitative interviews, people had heard of somebody doing something. Um, there, that there are a few instances, not many, but there were a, a few, a handful of instances people had heard of something. Um, and I remember um, interviewing a, a lady that was um, regularly smoked crack and, you know, she held up the device and she said, it, well, if I still smoked crack, the mind boggles, you know, what I, what I could use this for. So it was things like that. There, there were, but it was so anecdotal. I've heard of somebody in that area who did this. It was nothing really concrete. Um, there were some, I don't know if we want to discuss this today, but there were a couple of instances around the vouchers. Um, and maybe that's another discussion about incentives. Um, as I said in my presentation, most of the vouchers were used for essentials, like for food or to buy somebody a gift, or they were used for really, really good things. Um, but there were a couple of isolated incidents um, with vouchers um, that, that we heard of, um, either directly from participants or from other people. So I think that's something. Incentives you'll, is a tricky one because I don't think you'll ever please everybody. You've got the funder's requirements, you've got ethics committee requirements, you've got what the participants themselves would want, you've got the, the homeless centres management who probably have the best idea of what would be best for them and you're trying to work within that about what, what's the best thing to do, because you do want and you do need to thank people for their time. You do need to follow people up. Um, so yeah, so that's something, that's that's a tricky area for me is the incentives. But in terms of other adverse consequences, not, not really, no, no really negative feedback about the study. I'm gonna come around and ask everybody for a quick final comment, but before I'd look quite like a longer uh, comment from Robin, uh, you, you were, uh, very complimentary about the studies. I agree they had provided lots of uh, matters of interest. So did you experience any unintended consequences as, as a house no. host? And, no, and what are the most interesting and valuable learnings for you from the, the studies that we've heard? No, I mean, I can reinforce the, the obviously the researchers weren't, weren't there all the time. We were talking to people you know, all those times and all those weeks in between the, the different times when the researchers were there. And we did not perceive any negative consequences from this uh, project at all. There was enormous support for it from within the customer base. Uh, there were a couple of people who sold their vouchers uh, to buy something else with them. That's inevitable. But generally speaking, it was uh, it was fine in that regard as well. Um, the overall point I'd make, though, is that this did need quite a lot of behavioural reinforcement from practitioners, uh, both the um, researchers, who were fantastic, I would say, um, but also from our staff, and we put in a great deal of time to help motivate people to adhere to the programme, to participate and to maintain their progress. Um, and I, I would stress that people have been saying about could you do telephone support and could you do automatic uh, phone reminders and all the rest. None of that can replace the quality that face-to-face -face support to encourage people to participate uh, did within this study because it made a real difference to compliance and continued engagement. Um, so that's the big learning for me. Terrific. Robin, thank you very much. Louise, do you want to give us one last observation, comment? Sure. Uh, I suppose I've been reflecting on how many of us at the moment, because of the lockdown, are saying how miserable life is. Well, reflect, we could all reflect on how much more miserable life is if you're, <laughs> if you're cold, your feet are wet, um, you're shunned, people ignore you on the street. And, and, Smoking relieves some of that, but it also kills. So, um, you know, clean nicotine without the smoke, if this is what, you know, gives people some comfort when their lives are so bereft of comfort, you know, let's do it. Debbie. 
last couple of thoughts from you. You're on mute. You'd think after almost a year of using <laughs> Zoom, I'd be used to it, wouldn't you? Um, we all do it. Just, I think just to underscore kind of what I said at the end, the importance of just not giving up on people. Um, and, you know, going back time and time again with the offer of support um, and w in terms of stopping smoking. And, and I think from a health professional's perspective, we don't do that enough. We, we do it with... Um, we do it with other drugs so you know say with antipsychotic drugs we we wouldn't just give somebody an andropine and you know after a couple of weeks the patient says oh you know i don't like that that's a load of rubbish i'm not taking that and you wouldn't just say okay then you know i've got nothing else for you you would you try another drug and then you try another drug and then you try another drug and you just go back time and time and time again so uh, you know but not in a in a you know coercive way but in a in a in a compassionate uh, and a kind way and i think um you know going back to the value of having a, a specialist tobacco dependence treatment advisor um a lot of the people i've spoken to for the qualitative part of this have talked about her, her compassion um, and her kindness and and her understanding and they're really important qualities that you know we often overlook or forget that um you know, they're the they're the skills of, of of our whole workforce of tobacco dependence treatment advisors. Lynn, last thoughts from you. Also on mute. Yeah, I know. I was trying to answer some of the Q and A's <laughs> typing at the same time. Um, no last thoughts from me. Alison. And not for me either. Just thank you. This has been a really, really interesting session to be part of. So thank you to the organisers. Yes, thank you indeed. Thank you uh, also to the participants. We've just dipped below 100 for the first time. We started off with 150, uh, got almost 260 participants. And thank you to the 97 of you who, uh, well, I guess uh, 90 of you plus the seven of us uh, who are still on the call. Uh, and thank you for all your questions. They've been really good. We're sometimes accused of, um, in, in the UK, and especially the cohort around the table, of kind of medicalizing vaping, um, stressing the importance of behavioral support using it but but i think debbie's right with this group solidarity isn't a question of just dishing out vapes and walking off whether that uh compassionate support and expert advice comes from uh you know trained staff at a vape shop or uh stop smoking service or or, or, or you know clinicians um with the most deprived most uh the, the 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 smokers with the strongest needs the smokers we've been talking about today solidarity uh is about getting down with them and sticking with them by their sides and that's what leaving no smoker behind really means um you guys are completely awesome i just love working with you fill me with enthusiasm and respect thank you so much um Let's get on with 2021. Well, got rid of 2020. We made short work of that. Uh, have a great year. Thank you all, everybody, for joining.